All right. Well, welcome back to another episode of the Bigfoot Society uh, podcast. And we have the privilege this time of talking with Mr. Shane Corson. Uh, Shane is involved with all sorts of cool stuff, uh, Bigfoot, and I'll have him talk about that in a minute. But uh, the way that I picture it is uh, doing research into Shane. It's kind of like if you have the Marvel Avenger movies and you know Agent Coulson is there at the beginning. And then when you start to look for Agent Coulson, he's everywhere. So, I mean, you are you have your hands in everything, sir. Uh, would you mind going ahead and um, kind of what's a brief summary of who you are and what you've done in the Bigfoot community over the last few years, I guess? We'll start there. Okay. Well, I, I don't claim to have done anything, but I'll tell you, I was uh, born and raised in Scotland. Uh, had an interest in cryptids as a young in. Uh, I was always fascinated with, uh, of course, living in Scotland, you're fascinated with the Loch Ness Monster and Yeti and, and other cryptids that are, you know, uh, around the world. Always fascinated with the, the subject of Sasquatch. Moved over to the States in 93. Okay. Still, still fascinated with the Sasquatch phenomena. I really did not start uh, getting into uh, Sasquatch research or what I thought was Sasquatch research until about 97. And that's kind of when I got my wheels and was able to travel doing research in Southern California, where we moved to uh, around okay. San Bernardino Mountain, uh, Julian area. Um, and then definitely um, Yosemite was on my radar uh, mm. for a number of years. Uh, Yosemite was fascinating to me. Talked to a lot of great individuals, uh, individuals that had encounters, but I personally never found anything uh, during my years in California. Uh, eventually moved up to Oregon. I uh, okay. got married, moved up to Oregon in 2008. And that's mm. really where I started hitting the ground heavy Lucky. up in Oregon. Yep. And wow. I had an encounter in 2011 that uh, solidified the existence of Sasquatch for me. Okay. And from there, I realized that uh, being a one-man band, somebody that uh, is going about their business by themselves was not very productive. Uh, I realized that I really wasn't doing research. I was investigating stuff. Uh, I read every book out there. Okay. been online. Uh, I really had no contacts at that point. I talked to a few individuals and eventually got involved with the Olympic project um, mm -hmm. after my encounter and, and uh, got involved with like Cliff Berrickman and those individuals. Very cool. And uh, that's kind of really jumped uh, my research in, in joining a group and realizing that there's more to research than what you think. And I really wasn't conducting research. Now I'm now up in Washington State, um, okay. up in you know Western Washington here, uh, where we do a lot of research. And I work, you know, I'm one of the core members of the Olympic Project now, and I work with a amazing and fantastic group of like-minded individuals, both from the layman world and the academic world. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at now. I've been working on a lot of projects. Uh, I've been around the block, um, and there's a lot of cool stuff going on now. There's a lot of cool stuff that's happened. So uh, I'm very proud to be working with the individuals that I work with and collaborating with them. And, um, you know, I'm always an optimist. Uh, a lot of people get frustrated in this field, not me. I see all sorts of opportunities. Uh, in fact, right before this, this interview here, I just got off the phone with somebody that's working on an amazing project, very scientific project. And so mm. always uh, things going on behind the scenes. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Uh, where to start? So yeah, there's a lot of ways we could go. Um, so if I'm sure my listeners listen to Bigfoot and beyond with, uh, Cliff and Bobo as well, you had a fantastic episode on that and you referenced something that I, I wanted to ask you if you had been in the room, I would have asked you right there. Um, so you mentioned the Olympic project and I believe what you mentioned was that in the coming year, you would actually be having um, primatologists coming to the area. Did I get that right from the episode or maybe did I hear that um, uh, correctly? To, are you talking about the nest area? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We've actually already had primatologists. Uh, okay. Come out. Yeah. We've had primatologists come out to this area. We've had bear biologists come out to this area. We've had, um, anthropologists, uh, archaeologists, we've had oh, wow. uh, even zoologists, uh, which was the most recent 
Okay. Uh, two individuals came out from a certain zoo here in the United States, not in Washington, but a certain zoo. I okay. can't mention it, but yep. uh, they came out and, and we really wanted to get their feedback on, uh, you know, these nests. Uh, when it comes to known primate behavior, these individuals work directly with chimpanzees, bonobos, uh, mm. silverback gorillas. So we really wanted to get their feel on, on these nests uh, because they're not bare nests and they're not, uh, they're definitely nests and they're formulated. Um, Dr. Meldrum's talked about uh, these nests loads of times. So it's Cliff, they both been out to the area and helped us collect samples. So yes, we brought in a lot of academic individuals out there because we're not, you know, I'm not a, a scientist. I'm not an academic individual. I'm, I'm a, a, an explorer. I find stuff, I collect stuff. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll visually analyze stuff but I have my limits and I recognize those. Mm -hmm. And so you got to bring in sure. people with the right eye. So yeah, we've done that. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, if, if so, if uh, listeners do not know the nest we are talking about, of course, so um, and you can fill in details as we go along, of course, but there's, so you have access to a, an area of land where it had not been touched for, was it 40 years um, yeah, 50 plus years. Yeah, 50 plus years. So uh, like a logging company. Um, and uh, there's these nests that were found on there. And I mean, they're big enough for, I believe, I was either you or Cliff said that you could lay down mm. in the nest and it was quite comfortable. And um, man, it's just, it's fascinating. There was one part where it's like, you're saying from one nest, you could see the other nests. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was very fascinating yeah the the huckleberry so all these yes. nests uh there's 22 nests found to date uh spread mm -hmm. along a ridge line and they're spread out on fingers or saddles or ridges depending where you're from the country <laughs> everybody calls it something different but you have a ridge line with a finger or a ridge or a saddle coming down and they're spread out on multiple saddles fingers ridges or um and whatnot and uh they're, they're definitely formulated. They've been constructed intelligently. Mm -hmm. They're not uh, something mm -hmm. that's been haphazardly put together. And by what I, what I meant when I said, uh, and when I say that you can see from nest to nest, well, that's, that's on purpose. The huckleberry mm, yeah. branches have been stripped completely of leaves, whether uh, that was a food source or on purpose to see wow. from nest to nest to nest. And in they're they're uh, very strategically placed these nests, but yeah, you can see every nest and they range in size from, uh, you know, about three feet to about nine feet in size Man. and circumference. So, I mean, huge, huge. And, That's and awesome. over a foot in, in depth. I mean, just huge, a lot of material. That is very, very cool. A um, question I, I also thought of the other day is, so, uh, of course, right now we're in the middle of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. How has that affected the work of the Olympic project? tremendously yeah uh, you know uh, nobody gets paid to do sasquatch research we sure. all have day jobs uh, we have families and so it's really um there's a lot of stuff we can do at home and fortunately we do have access to you know when it comes to research we do have access to uh, timberland we have gate keys and whatnot and okay. that's where we conduct a lot of our business but this whole covid thing regardless of what you think of it and how it's yep. affected you it's affected yep. everybody yep economically, socially, you name it. And so um, I can speak for a lot of uh, enthusiasts, Bigfoot researchers, uh, you name it, that it's affected it big time. You can't get into some areas that you used to be able to get into legally. <laughs> I mean, sure, I'm sure people are sure. sneaking out. Uh, here in Washington, <laughs> um, they closed down. Uh, it's opening up May 5th, uh, all the trails and parks and whatnot, but it's affected it tremendously. And what re it's really done for the Olympic Project recently, um, kind of jumping ahead here, we, we've come across some newer nests. Uh, finally, oh, wow. after searching for four years, five years now, we came across a new nest. Um, I'm not, I can't really get into the details right now, Okay. but uh, a partner of mine by the name of uh, uh, Todd Hale, he's a, a, a Olympic project member. We were out scouting an area that Derek Randalls and I had scouted uh, two weeks prior. Well, we went back out to this area and uh, came across something physically making a nest did not see it but spooked it sounded very large sounded bipedal oh and, wow and oh it was it was quite the experience um and i won't get into that right now that's uh, some stuff we're working on but we did come across a nest in the making or multiple nests in the making and we came across a lot of other really unique Man. and very cool tidbits to this that uh it proved a lot of things to us so we were in the right area 
uh, mm -hmm. the right time of year, the right circumstances. And we just got really lucky and walked upon something making a new nest. But to go back to your, your question, well, I, I have uh, some samples um, that I've collected that we've collected as a whole as a limb project that I got, I can't send it anywhere right now, you know, it, mm, um, and, yeah. and it's, um, it sucks because some of these samples, the, you know, they, they, they go to junk after a while. It's time sensitive sort of stuff. Um, and some, you know, you know, we got some hair samples, for example, uh, some mm -hmm. of that you could visually analyze, but to do any real work on it, it's, man, it's really been, it was just, this whole virus is the worst timing. And we talked about that yeah. as a group, the worst timing yeah. ever, unfortunate, but upwards and onwards, you keep plugging away and, and we'll see if we, anything yeah. comes from this, no promises, no guarantees, but exciting. Uh, it tells me we're, we're doing something right. Regardless, you can say, regardless of what's making these nests, um, we, we came across whatever was making it fresh. And that's, that's awesome. That, that is really exciting. And, um, maybe you can start to see a pattern like, okay, it's this time of year, you know, who knows the data that you'll get from this, like this, that is super exciting. And that's, you said that's very recent that that happened. Yeah. This happened back in February. So wow. I mean, super recent <clears throat> and uh, very cool. The, uh, the, 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 the real key there is that we, we hypothesized originally that the older nest that we had, uh, we were led to, we didn't discover the old, old nest. They were discovered originally by a timber cruiser in a really remote area doing his job. Mm -hmm. so these, these areas aren't places you go hiking in, you go uh, hunting in, exploring in. They're off trail. They're hard to get to. They're, it's a nightmare. And he came across them. Well, we, we started to mimic what he was doing uh, mm -hmm. for years and possibly came across some very, very old nest. Uh, so we're, like, oh, we're kind of on the right track. Maybe. We don't know. And then we come across this, and that was in the month of February again with the same elements. You got the salmon coming up these creeks. You got yep. uh, a lot of things going for you. So you're right. It does add value to that. And, and it's exciting. Tells us we're on yeah. the right track. Oh man, that is, that is very cool. Um, you've also been involved with um, <clears throat> the, uh, the devil's Creek project. And uh, that was uh, a few years ago where that, where there was a lot of that, you know, uh, those stories going around and you know, what was going on. Would you be able to kind of, um, you know, there's a chance there's some listeners that, you know, when I say Devil's Creek, they, they might not know what I'm talking about, but would you be able to maybe uh, give a summary of um, that scenario? And then um, you'd mentioned before our call started that uh, you actually have uh, some, some new things that you can share, some things you can't because it's, you know, um, special situation, but yeah, if you go ahead with that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So s several years ago, Derek Randalls was contacted by an individual by the name of Donna. Um, mm -hmm. Her husband's name is Greg, up here in Western Washington on the east side of the Olympics. And they had a lot of suspicious activity going on on their property. Well, Donna's husband, Greg, he worked all around, he, he works all around the country. So he was rarely home. And Donna had all the stuff, weird stuff happening, noises, um, uh, stuff happening on the property. And her husband, Greg, when he was home, would witness some of this. The majority seemed to happen when she was home. But he got to witness a lot of um, unique things, especially audio, things mm -hmm. they found on their property. And so they got a hold of Derek Randalls of the Olympic Project. And he came out. And um, Derek's not an audio guy. Uh, and so he, he got them in touch with David Ellis of the Olympic Project, mm -hmm. who is like the audio guru. He looks at yes. audio visually on a, a sonic visualizer program. And so he's not just listening because your ear will play tricks on you. But if you can visually analyze something and listen to it, it really adds value. And you can exactly. compare those um, recorded sounds to the Macaulay Library of Sounds, for example. So you have a context and, and a baseline to compare unknown sounds, at least unknown to you. Um, and so uh, David and Donna really started uh, play, you know, placing audio recorders on the property. Well, I mean, uh, to backtrack a little bit, um, Donna had a sighting uh, near her property, um, you know, when they were driving up the road to their property, just down the road in, in what uh, it's been coined Devil's Creek. And let me clarify something. Uh, there is no Devil's Creek. You know, there's no Devil's Creek. It, it was a name made up by a third party that got involved. Um, and, you know, at first, a lot of us really didn't like the name Devil's Creek because um, okay. there are Devil's Creeks around the country. This was a pseudo name, just a made up name. 
Um, we stuck with it mainly because there was a lot of individuals trying to find this area and we, it, we wanted to throw them off. They, you know, they were trying to, yeah. there's a lot of that clever smart. people out there. That was very smart. Find, yeah, yeah. They find spots. So we stuck yeah. with Devil's Creek, not, not the greatest name and um, a little bit disingenuous, but there was a reason behind that. Sure. Now, um, don't get me wrong. There's a lot that Creek uh, plays a huge role uh, in this whole uh, experience, this phenomena. And so um, after David L started recording stuff, Donna, you know, previously had her, her sighting. Um, I started getting involved in going up there, placing audio. And um, I spent quite a few nights out there on the property, had some of my own experiences, no, no sightings. And I do have clear equipment. I tried very thick, um, hilly area. Mm. And uh, it wasn't like every night. It was uh, every once in a while. But this went on for several years. And I did get the chance. Donna called me up one day um and said hey well, basically backtrack a little bit some more um don and greg actually moved out of that house planning on renting it or possibly selling it they oh. they got a, another house um uh, well not nearby but you know about an hour is away from this place they got another house so they're paying two mortgages and they wanted oh. to do something with this property but they knew that it was important for research and so they weren't ready to give it up. I mean, God bless them. Cause it, yeah. we, we did record a lot of neat stuff on the, the property experience, a lot of neat stuff. Um, and as, as they were living on this separate property, they were trying to fix up this house and they hired a, a contractor, a contracting business to come up and fix one of their, like a kind of a guest house slash garage. And lo and behold, um, this guy, this con one of the contractors had a siding, possibly two sightings in the mm -hmm. area. Um, and he knew nothing about the Bigfoot phenomenon going on in the property. He knew nothing about it. I interviewed That's the, guy the best himself. part. That's the best part where he's like, oh, it's a little weird. I don't know what's going on. That's exactly, awesome. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Uh, I, uh, yep. You know, um, we talked about this in, on uh, Monster X Radio, my podcast. But okay. the point being is that it was just, it was phenomenal. And, uh, you know, and going through this area over the years and, and studying this area, uh, some of the elderly neighbors that live uh, close by, one of the, the women who has an apple orchard in this area, she knew there was Sasquatch. She straight up told Donna mm -hmm. one day without Donna really, you know, insinuating anything. Yeah, it's Sasquatch. It's up in this area. So there's a lot of uh, collaboration there, a lot of ideas there where other people are aware of this. Other people have seen stuff and, and there's no, it's not as if they're having a discussion on Sasquatch. It just pops up. Okay. Um, yeah. And then historically in this area, um, there's multiple reports. The only project is taken in personally. I, I've had people that are close in, in the know of this area that have uh, talked about other reports from neighbors and, and people within a couple of square miles uh, mm. and some of the lakes in this area, there's reports. So why, why Donna was having this activity on the property? I don't know. Um, you know, okay. she was home alone. Her house was like a lot of really big windows where something from the forest line could watch her. There was apple orchards in the area. Um, a lot of hypothesizing here, but uh, no doubt she had a lot, tremendous amount of activity on this property. Now, uh, fast forward, um, there were some unfortunate events that took place. Uh, unfortunately, Don and Greg sold the property mm. um, and they no longer have access to the property. Oh, uh, there's man. still stuff going on in some adjacent areas that I follow, but it's not an area you can get into okay. without getting into trouble. And it's private property and all that stuff. So it's a real shame there. But I get that's terrible. Yeah, you know, uh, paying two mortgages and just that Donna did not feel comfortable staying there anymore, and they sure. had to leave. So, um, as far as Devil's Creek's concerned, um, there's not really anything ongoing there now. As far as research, I'm not been in contact with the new inhabitants. They're not aware of any of the stuff that went on there. I'm not sure if they're experiencing anything. Um, uh, that that's a story in itself. It's like, did they know what they were getting into buying that property? And like, if they're just slowly, I, I don't think it would be slow. I think it would be quick that they would figure out like, uh, there's something going on here, you know, who knows? Right. I mean, yeah. all bets are off. I don't know. Um, I do know that there's still some occasional activity in that general area. I still get reports from that area. I do still visit some of the, the adjacent areas. Uh, but it's not, you know, as far as the property is concerned, I don't get, I can't get access to that. And uh, sure. definitely okay. in my, my, my personal opinion, they definitely had Sasquatch stuff going on. I mean, no doubt about it with, with the multiple sightings from different individuals and the things that have occurred with me, I've had uh, rocks thrown and stuff like that. And um, I couldn't spend enough time there. I really wanted to capture something on a FLIR 
and I spent many nights there by myself, um, edge of the property, and I had you know a lot of experience. I never got anything on FLIR. The brush is so thick, and, and whatever it was would never get close enough for me to get on FLIR. <laughs> so it is what it is. Yeah. Man, thanks for sharing. That that's that's a really cool update. I had no idea that that had yeah, that's that not happened. really been yeah. shared. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But I'll tell you, real quick, I'll know. tell you, Don yeah. and Greg, sorry to interrupt you. Don and Greg are two fantastic, phenomenal individuals. I have the, the utmost respect for them. Um, Donna and uh, David Elst did phenomenal audio work on the property. And uh, I know Donna is very thankful for David Ellis and, and Derek and myself. Uh, two stand up individuals that didn't ask for this, it just happened. And they were willing to go along and, and do what they could to a certain extent. And unfortunately, things didn't work out. Um, with, with their lives and, and with the property, but the chance to, um, to get involved with one of these rare occurrences where you have this consistent activity happening on the property, not necessarily year round, but consistently, that's the sort of places you want to be in. Cause I'm not a, I'm not per se an ambulance chaser. I don't, you know, mm-hmm. those days are past. I don't, uh, you know, Derek Randall's on the Olympic project, the, the co-founder of the Olympic project taught me this years ago. You know, he, he for years, uh, he's been in research since 1985, and he used to go to Idaho. I mean, living in Washington, would go to Idaho at the drop of a hat looking for, uh, you know, if there was an encounter, he'd drive out there or wherever. Mm, and okay. you can get a lot of good information out of that, but it's almost, you know, the, the crime's done. And to find a, a place where there's a lot of activity and it's ongoing, that's really not ambulance chasing. You're trying to do a conductive study there and figure out what's going on. True. So that's, that, that's something I think when those uh, occurrences happen, and it's happened a few times in my experience uh, with, with this research and, and, and some others, that's the places you really want to be. Mm. Very cool. Very cool. Um, I'm going to throw out uh, a random uh, left field question just to see if anything sticks. I'll switch. If it doesn't, we'll go to somewhere else. <sighs> so you've had all these... Um, you know, you're focused on Bigfoot. Um, I'm in uh, this, the Midwest area. We have a lot of like um, things flying around, Thunderbirds, stuff like that. Have you ever run into any weird stuff? I don't know. Is that a thing where those actually will come up in the Pacific Northwest, like um, large flying cryptids or anything like that, or not really a thing that you, you run up against? Uh, well, here's the thing, you know, growing up, I was involved in, interested in a lot of cryptids, not involved. I was interested in all sorts of cryptids. So I'm well burst on a lot of cryptids up here in the Pacific okay. Northwest. I mean, you go to Portland and, and you know, that there's a big sign that says, keep Portland weird down in yeah, Oregon. No, it's, 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 it's great. Yeah. Yeah. And it is weird. Uh, the, you know, the Pacific Northwest is a weird spot. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, things that, you know, people will claim to see, you know, they have a uh, Cadborosaurus on the coast that uh, apparently it's a, like a water cryptid. It goes oh, wow. from San Francisco all the way up to Alaska. They call it caddy. Um, mm. There's, um, the, of course, the, the large thunderbirds. Uh, there's, you know, pterodactyl, pteranodon sightings, apparently. You got UFO sightings. Um, I personally never seen any of that stuff. And I spend, I mean, I live in the woods and I spend ungodly amount of time in the woods. I've never personally come across, you know, I've never seen any weird orbs or lights, um, you know, none of that stuff. But you do hear stories uh, from credible people that claim to have seen, you know, Cadborosaurus or um, a, a flying cryptid that's much larger and acting peculiar. Uh, you do have people claiming to see lights in the woods or UFOs. I mean, uh, Washington State, you know, when, I think one of the really first big UFO sightings was um, around Mount Rainier back in, ooh, what, the 60s, 50s, or 70s, I forget, mm. uh, flying discs. Uh, so it's an area where there's a lot of stuff that happens up here and different cryptids, you know. Uh, we know mainly though uh, my focus and mainly what I come across is Sasquatch sightings up yeah, here and yeah, it, it's way more prevalent than people will ever guess you know for every you know one sighting you hear about or two sightings you hear about there's I mean I can only imagine how many more sightings are out there that you know from people that are either not willing to talk or just don't have an opportunity to talk about it very cool very cool um, you'd mentioned before that you have actually you spent time in the Yosemite area um, early on. Um, can you go in? I've actually, so I visited that area. It's a beautiful area. Oh. And 
I'll just, I'll paint a little picture. Um, when we drove there from um, Cupertino area, you lose cell service mm. like an, like two hours outside of the park. It mm-hmm. felt like it was nuts. And there was a part when we were like driving around in this little electric car up these hills and like we had to stop and literally if you had stepped, you always hear people say this, if you stepped a foot off the road, you would be lost, like you'd be done. It yeah. was prehistoric and it was amazing. Um, do you have any, um, you know, can you re- recall anything that happened uh, around that area or like any uh, cool stories about researching that area or? Yeah, I mean, uh, so from uh, when I, uh, one of my old girlfriends worked at Yosemite and that really was a, uh, oh, nice. a, a kick in the pants to get up there even more <laughs> so. But Yosemite, when my first, I remember going through, um, a tunnel and come into an area inspiration point and seeing mm-hmm. the Yosemite Valley. And it w- was absolutely amazing. Um, a guy yeah. from Scotland that got to witness that, you know, I was, you know, enthralled. I could see why, you know, Theodore Roosevelt and some of these others, you know, said, this is God's country. It's just amazing mm-hmm. country. I just amazing. So I fell in love with it. And, and of course I heard about all these Sasquatch reports in the Sierras and Yosemite and all that. So I made it a point, you know, even though from, I live in San Diego, it was like 11, 12 hour drive. I would do it as much mm. as I could. And I did it for years. Yeah. Wow. An amazing area. Um, I've been all around Yosemite, backpacking Yosemite. I've been up to Half Dome. I've been all around El Cap, um, oh, wow. Yosemite Falls. I've been all around there. And I always like to backpack, you know, um, off trail and off country. I personally, you know, I've had a lot of bear encounters up there, a ton of bear encounters. There's really? bears up there galore. Oh, oh yeah. Man. I'm chasing from my camp up there. I never ha- personally had a Bigfoot encounter up there. I, I came across one impression I thought was interesting. Could have mm-hmm. been a double bear stamp. Um, the most interesting thing that, um, that I took away from Yosemite, besides just that it's, it's so vast. And, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of people that go there. Um, I talked to a, a former park ranger. She was a female, and she was um, working the El Cap area below the base okay. uh, um, near a hotel out there. And she had something throwing rocks at her. And when she looked up from this little bluff, uh, she saw this black shadow and it took off bipedally up the hill. And I heard oh, that wow. first person. Now we're talking uh, 97 through about 2006 is kind of the time frame I would go up there. Really, okay. I didn't, uh, back in 97, I had a beeper. I didn't really have a cell phone, <laughs> you know? So um, <laughs> it wasn't like uh, I could get cell phone reception anyways. But uh, that's awesome. You know, there are a lot of missing people in that area, but I'll tell you, it's easily, it, you can get lost up there easy. And um, I mean, the last time I was there last summer, um, I, I realized I will never go there during the height of the season. I took my family down there. Mm. They had never been there. My eight-year-old daughter and my wife, we took them out. I took them out there on our way down to San Diego, driving down from Washington. We stood, uh, we, we sat in our car for over an hour trying to get into the park. It was oh, a nightmare. Man, really? There's so many people, millions of people. Wow. I, mean, I forget the number, but it's over a million people that go through the park every year. You got that many people come through a park yeah. and you got a lot yeah. of tourists from out of the country. They don't speak English that, that had no business being in the woods. People are going to get hurt and people are going to disappear. So it's no shock to me that I always get, well, oh, Yosemite's a hotspot. Well, yeah, but there's, when you have that number of people that go through that area, it's to be expected. You know, I, I can't count how many times that I came across hurt people or lost people out there while I was hiking and uh, the amount oh, of really? dangers out there. Oh yeah. Wow. All the time. I mean, I, I experienced that up here in the Pacific Northwest hiking the Olympics. There's sure people that are unprepared or ill-prepared and don't know what they're doing. So yeah, I mean, Yosemite, I, I have no doubt there's probably Sasquatch down there. I just, you know, and talking to a few people that had experiences really solidified that for me, but I never had an encounter down there. Uh, but you know, when you live 11, 12 hours away and you're kind of like uh glorified yep. camping because you're just doing it for a weekend or four days or whatever you can only do so much and it's an area that you need to live in the sierras beautiful tons of wildlife and if you think yosemite is primordial or you know you know jurassic park ish uh, come up to mm-hmm. uh, washington state or oregon specifically washington state up in the olympics where you got moss oh, and and rainforest i've been it's there crazy i've been there yeah we, we hike we hike the whole uh, as a whole rainforest oh the whole rainforest is crazy yeah. It's nuts. Um, Primordial. Yeah, we've been to the, the Forks area and, and all that. Um, that's a different story. But the whole rainforest is simply beautiful. Oh, it, unexpected part of the trip, definitely. Yeah, amazing. Um, man. 
as we start to kind of get towards the end of our time here, um, what is what is kind of next for, I know the Olympic project is, is probably the main focus of your, your time with squatching. Um, is there uh, anything that maybe you can um, uh, tease us with something that you guys are, are working towards, or I guess you did say that you, you found these new met, new vests, which uh, nests, which are huge. That's, that's a, a huge deal. Cause you thought that you, that was a dead end, but then finding new ones, that's incredible. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So basically, um, so, you know, this initial nest site that was uh, discovered by this timber cruiser was probably the most exciting thing and still is the most exciting thing I've ever worked on based on a number of factors based on just so many different things. And, you know, historically speaking, there's been other nests found, but just not this many and not study like this where you have unknown uh, hair that matches primate hair is Dr. Meldrum will tell you. You have awesome. um, nests formulated and constructed. Uh, the huckleberry breaks and snaps and every, how it was formulated. You needed a posable thumb. You had rocks that had score marks found. You had bush nests off the ground that were constructed like the ground nests. Um, so still, it, it was and still is the most exciting thing. Now, going forward, well, finally, after four years, we've come across some possibly new nests, but so actually cool. being... I just, you know, and, and all we had as a goal as a team was to find n more nest and yeah. n as new as can be. I had no idea that we were going to come across something making a nest oh, man. as it was that being was so made. Cool. And um, now we got all, we got some samples. We got some casts of different things wow. that uh, I'll eventually release. Uh, we've had um, some cool. really key people involved with helping us cast this stuff. And so going forward, Really, it's uh, we're just uh, we're not ambulance chasing. We're studying this one area, this mm -hmm. one vast area, yep. Yep. as much as we can, collecting audio. You know, we do use some troll cameras, but lightly. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're just you know studying the area, getting to know all the known animals in this area, all the sounds they make, so that we can roll in or roll out what we're recording if it's suspicious. Um, collecting data from the this new nest site, looking for new nest sites, but at the same time, we're also Here's the thing. Something's making these nests and making them for a reason. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of you when you're out there and uh, you feel guilty because you disturb something and the amount of work that went into making like even this new nest, this, mm -hmm. it was in the, you know, the process of making it, the, the amount of work when my partner, I disrupted it, you know, when I got back to our camp, because it was in the evening and we just kind of, we backed out of there. It was getting dark when on it, you know, I don't care what's making. I didn't want to disturb it and mm -hmm. didn't know if we were in a good spot to be disturbing anything. Uh, basically we went back in there the next day with a few more people and discovered what we discovered. But part of you feels guilty for disrupting something, making that, uh, but you know, it is what it is. And uh, yeah. you know, and we'll study that area, you know, it's disturbed. So we're, we're constantly looking for new nests. At the same time, we're also trying to be not jerks, you know, um, you know, if something's <laughs> making a, a nest for a little one or a baby or a newborn, you know, who are we to go in these areas and disturb them and uh, disrupt point. that, That's that amount point. of work. So it's yeah. a catch 22, uh, yeah. the same, you know, science moves on, but at the same time, uh, you know, I, I don't want it. To, I'd rather come find the nest later after it's been departed. Yep, you know, exactly. So that's kind of where we're at. And that's what we're focused on is finding new nests and studying these nests and learning everything we can about these ne new nests. And, and, and the LM project is not about proving Sasquatch exists. We're about studying what we already pretty much know to exist. The majority of our LM project members, uh, we do have skeptics and in, in those individuals that never had an encounter, but we're about collecting as much data. So when that day comes across that uh, Sasquatch is proven, we already have everything laid out there for yeah. academia to look at. You're good to go. And yep. uh, yeah, it's so fun. And it gets us out in the woods, which we enjoy and we have a great group. Right. Because at the end of the day, you're still spending a lot of good time in nature, which there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing. Um, if people want to uh, keep track of what you're doing, what is the best, uh, the best, uh, things for them to look at website or social media, or what have you. Yeah. So we have, um, our website is, it's still, we're still building upon this and working on it. A lot of us, like I said, are, we have Dave jobs, so it's hard to keep up, but we do keep right. up. So olympicproject.com, you can send emails there. 
um, anything audio and all that you can share and we will get back to you at some point in time. David Ellis kind of really leads that, pardon me, at this point in time. Um, of course, I do host my own podcast called Monster X Radio and mm-hmm. you can reach um, me or, or my partner Gunnar Monson at Monster X Radio uh, one gmail.com. Okay. And, uh, you know, so I'm on Facebook, Shane Corson. So if you got any, you know, you can reach out to me on Facebook at Shane Corson and I'm on Instagram, Twitter and all that stuff. But, the uh, limp project.com is probably the best way. And we have lots of resources and lots of individuals on there. David Ellis, Derek Randall's myself, um, just a ton of, you know, Cindy Dosen, a ton of different individuals from different backgrounds and different fields that may be able to help you out or just check out the website and, uh, it'll be updated even more so down the road here. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you again, Shane, for coming on tonight and spending a little bit of a time with uh, the Bigfoot Society podcast and uh, some some pretty cool updates. I'm sh- I'm sure all the listeners out there will be checking out uh, the uh, Olympic Project website and uh, keeping track of what you guys find next. So thank you again, sir. Thank you, Jeremiah. I appreciate it. Yep. Have a, uh, have a good night.